to the club. So we we go through the progression. The first thing that we always want to account for is the domain. Okay. This is a um, polynomial function. Polynomial functions are infinite to some extent. Right? So it goes in terms of the domain, negative infinity to infinity. It's also everywhere continuous, so we're not worried about any kind of funky spots along the way, like asymptotes, things like that. All right. So get into the derivative. G prime would be equal to 3x squared. Since I'm looking for concavity, I might as well find G double prime, which would be 6x. Right. To find relative extrema, we find critical values. Those critical values would occur wherever the function is equal to zero or undefined, the, the derivative that is. So I would set my derivative equal to zero and if necessary, set it equal to undefined. It's like we did up here, sometimes it's irrelevant. So if it's irrelevant, we can exclude that step, but if you don't want to take any chances, you could just throw it in there. All right, so this one ends up giving no solution, but this one gives you x equals zero. So that's a critical value. All right, to find possible points of inflection, not guaranteed, but a possible point of inflection, we take our second derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve. So this is a possible point of inflection. Well, it can't, it, it can't be both. It can't be a relative extreme and also a point of inflection. So it's got to be one or the other. So time chart will bear that out. All right, Travis, I'll get you for a few minutes. No, I hope that didn't just come up with the screen, but whatever. I know later, I guess. So I'm going to make a sign chart out of this and get to the bottom of which is which, or well, not even which is which, what x equals zero amounts to a critical value, as in relative extreme or a point of inflection. So Creating my sign chart, I'm going to start off at negative infinity, go to zero, stop at zero, and then go to rest of the way from zero to infinity. I'm going to evaluate my first derivative, well, really G prime, right? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you wrote F prime, but it, you can avoid it, it's nicer. And then we'll draw a conclusion about the original function G of X. All right, so I'm going to make my chart oh that's fun that took off on me oh, actually I just do one more Okay, so I have the makings of the chart and this chart will answer our questions because if we annotate everything appropriately, then we'll be in good shape, right? So we know that zero is gonna give us zero for the first and second derivative. It's just a question of what's going on here, right? So what we can do, and we can handle this a few different ways. One way would be on Desmos, but then again, if you're gonna do it on Desmos, if you just look at the picture and see, you know, the different attributes of the function, okay? If I choose a value that's in this domain, negative infinity to zero, anything I want, I would then put that in for X here and X here and see what it gives us. Let's say I take the number negative one. If I put a negative one in for X in my derivative function, I'm gonna square it, making it positive, multiply it by three, it's still gonna be positive. So that means the function is increasing over this interval. 
if I take a value between zero and infinity, like for example, positive one, plug it in for X in my first derivative, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a positive one squared, I'm positive one, multiply it by three, positive three, it's still positive. In which case, it would always be increasing, all right? It's increasing, well, except for at zero where it levels off, but it, it, that doesn't amount to a relative max or a relative min because it never turns around upon itself. It doesn't come back down, all right? I would need it to go from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, in which case it would be a minimum. It doesn't do that. So we would say that there are no relative extrema here. All right, now for the second derivative, if I take a negative number and put it into this function, my second derivative function, like for example, a negative one, plug it in for x, I get a negative six, a negative value, meaning it's concave down, CD, CD for concave down. All right. If I plug in a positive number to my second derivative function, like a positive one, one times six is six, still positive, that's gonna be concave up, We have a change in concavity, which means that we're dealing with a point of inflection, a POI. So we've confirmed that this is a point of inflection at x equals zero. And right, so the sign chart answers the questions, or answers, well, I guess the questions, plural. Uh, it addresses every concern that the, the, uh, the, the problem was offering. It's just the only thing that you'd have to be mindful of is just the phrasing of a question. If it said determine the points, or the coordinates, then it would be asking for particular uh, locations on the graph, like x comma y. Then you might have to take an additional step, but that's really um, that's really the only extent uh, to which the the problem could be modified. Okay. But you could do, like I was saying, I think last time, g of x. You know, just put in our original function is equal to x cubed plus two. Take a look at the picture. You see that it never turns around on itself. It does look like there's a change in concavity at zero. All right, it looks like it's going upward, but with a concave down look until it gets to this location, which it's still going upward, but with a concave up look. All right, so that would make this location right here the point of inflection. All right, so you can pull that off the graph. Now, if you wanted to use Desmos to create your sign chart for you, or to help you, I should be more specific, help you create the sign chart, you type in G prime of A, create a slider at A, and it'll tell you what the derivative value would be. I really hate when that happens. It'll tell you what the derivative value would be for a variety of a value so evaluating the function at particular location so like for example i've been referring to negative one my derivative function is positive at positive one it's also positive but really for any value less than one you know i'm doing it fast but you can see it doesn't matter really how fast i go the sign of these values is never changing they're always positive except for that one instance or it's equal to zero, right? And that's at zero. In every other instance, no matter what a value I put in, x equals a value, the result is gonna be positive, right? We do the same thing for the second derivative, right? The issue is, you know, I was going to say the issue is that that doesn't work all the time. However, I guess I stumbled on the one instance where it does. Um, either that or they updated the software, or maybe I'm just thinking of something else. I don't know. Or maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. 
I mean, I know, maybe, I know I'm just getting old. Um, but for whatever reason, I had it in my head that you could not find the second derivative easily with Desmos. And I literally just took a chance. And I'm so happy to see that I, at least for this type of function, hopefully for another, we'll try it again in, uh, in number three, but it looks like I just proved myself wrong on a whim, which, which I, I, that's usually what happens. I take a chance and things work out. All right, so how did I do that? I mean, I didn't even look at the chat, but um, it's possible that that question's in there. If not, <laughs> it probably should be. Um, you just do a double prime. So prime and then a second prime. I, I think, I don't know, I might be making stuff up now. I think at one point I tried using a quote, like, shift comma on a regular keyboard and maybe that didn't work i don't think it ever occurred to me to just go the apostrophe route oh sh not shift comma shift um shift apostrophe it just never occurred to me to go apostrophe apostrophe i don't know it, which actually makes sense uh, now i need to know sorry Okay, it works for a third derivative also. That's uh, enlightening and I'm all the better off for it. All right, so let's see. Can you explain why it's one over zero on the right side? Where did the one come from? Oh, on the left side. Um, I'm assuming that you're referring to this part of it. This, oh, what am I hitting here? This, whenever you're, um, trying to find critical values, you always set equal to zero and set equal to one over zero, all right? The idea being that a critical value can occur where a function is equal to zero or where, I'm sorry, where a derivative function is equal to zero or where a derivative function is undefined. And right? so we always have to test for that. Now, as it turned out, if we cross multiplied here, cross multiplied here, we would have got zero equals one, which leads to a contradiction. So it became irrelevant. So in all honesty, the most forgot, most typically forgotten step in all of calculus very often ends up being the most irrelevant step in all of calculus. But it, the, the times it is irrelevant, uh, I'm sorry, the times that it is relevant could be enough to, to mess you up uh, significantly. So number three, I'm very excited about this double prime business. Honestly, I don't even know why it never occurred to me to use the, the, the prime symbol multiple times. It's just really, it's typical me, but whatever. Anyway, so let me just clean this up. I'm just gonna go for a new one, new blank graph. Uh, so the tangent function is undefined. Uh, really, I mean, depending on, you know, the multipliers involved in a tangent function, but you know, if you're dealing with just a parent function, the tangent function itself is undefined at pi over two, three pi over two, and any two pi rotation away from those two angles, All right? So if you're not sure, you just type in the function over the, over the restricted interval, right? So this would be, they're saying h, so I'll use h. h of x is equal to 2x minus function tangent x. All right, good looking function right there. But I want it to be restricted over the interval of negative pi over 2. the pi over two excluding the negative pi over two and pi over two, the parentheses exclude. That's hopefully we remember. If not, that's why I said, all right. So this is the function that we're interested in. And you can see here that it does have a, an asymptotic relationship 
but it's just a question of over this interval, what are we looking at in terms of increasing, decreasing concavity and all that, right? So fortunately, along this relevant interval, it, does, it doesn't seem like there are any breaks in the graph. That being said, we're still gonna check for it when we take the derivative, right? Uh, the points of non-differentiability, right? So I'm gonna find h prime of x, which will be two minus the derivative of tangent, secant squared x, All right, so that that's a fact, or you could figure it out. But I would imagine that just studying the fact is probably the preferred way to go. Right? Now we can modify this because most folks look at secant squared and say, "Ah, I'm not I'm not too keen on that," and that's fine because, well, there's there's a couple of schools of thought, but the the easiest way to look at this would be to say secant squared is the same as one over cosine squared. So I can think of my derivative function like that. We set it equal to zero. And we set it equal to one over zero. All right. This is going to help us find our critical values. Now, we'll have to take the derivative of this in a second in order to determine any possible points of inflection. And based off the picture, it looks like there's one, but well, one thing at a time. All right, we already, we already got to have a mountain of work just with the critical values. So just kind of cross one bridge at a time, I guess. All right, so we can get uh, a common denominator and put these two fractions together, all right? So this two, I'm gonna move this off to the side for a sec. Just move it way out of here for a minute. Just give myself a little bit of space and then I'll put it all back together. But that two can be thought of as two over one. I can multiply that by cosine squared X over cosine squared X. All right, so that would simplify down to two cosine squared X minus one over cosine squared X. That's no different for the other equation. Ooh, where did that green line come from? It came from last week. Uh, so this expression here would be the same thing except it's going to be equal to, like I said, one over cosine, uh, one over zero. All right, so cross multiply and solve. So this zero on the left here can be thought of as zero over one, cross multiply and solve, and we get zero is equal to two cosine squared X minus one. Do the same thing on the other or for the other equation and you get cosine squared x is equal to zero all right so this equation is a little easier all i gotta do is take the square root cosine x is equal to zero the other one i gotta add a one to both sides looking at one is equal to two cosine squared x Divide both sides by two. So we're looking at one half is equal to cosine squared x, at which point I would take the square root of both sides. So a little extra, a little extra stuff going on there. All right. So you probably saw this coming. Resize about to happen. A resize and a zoom in. All right, when you take the square root of one half, so actively taking the square root gives you a plus or minus. So plus or minus one over radical two, we simplify that. That's gonna be equal to cosine of X. 
Now, if you rationalize that denominator, right, multiply top and bottom by rad two, you're gonna get radical two over two. So plus or minus radical two over two is equal to, to the equal to the cosine of X. So to get my critical values, I need any instance in which cosine is equal to radical two over two or negative radical two over two. And I need any instance in which cosine is equal to zero, all right? So if I'm spinning around the unit circle, it's a lot of different possibilities. However, they gave us a domain that said we had to live specifically between negative pi over two and pi over two. So if I just sketch that out real quick. So here's my whole unit circle. Okay, let me do that again, less terribly, hopefully. Here's my whole unit circle. What they're saying is that I'm only interested in the interval between negative pi over two and pi over two. So just these two quadrants, all right? So that, that actually cleans things up a little bit, all right? Because in the first quadrant, there's only one instance in which it's, which the cosine value is equal to radical two over two. And that would be at pi over four. In the fourth quadrant, there's only one instance in which it would be equal to radical two over two. That would normally be seven pi over four, but we're actually just going the same angular distance, but in the opposite direction. So we would call that negative pi over four. All right. Now, so, so that gives us X for this, this piece here, X is equal to, really I could just say plus or minus pi over four. Now, where cosine is equal to zero, that would be on the y-axis. That would only happen at negative pi over two or pi over two. But that's outside the domain, so that's irrelevant. Which is kind of annoying, you know, because it's not fun to do all that work to find solutions that don't amount to anything, but needed to check. And so we have our critical values, which would be negative pi over four and positive pi over four in terms of X, All right? You can verify that pretty quickly because the critical value should happen at the turning points. And it's just flat out telling us that that's negative pi over four and pi over four. Right, so we're we're kind of like steered towards the right values, but what I need to do now is take the second derivative. Little little chuckle escape there, sorry. Right, so we got to find the second derivative, and from there, I'm just going to get rid of this out, at least for now. Put it back in later, and then set that second derivative equal to zero and solve. Right, so I'm going to rewrite. My first derivative just off on the side here. And use that to find the second derivative. All right. Fortunately, the constant's going to go away for whatever that's worth. All right. So I'm only looking to take the derivative of this piece. All right. So using the chain rule, the derivative of negative secant squared, so power multiplied by coefficient, the so negative two secant raised to the first power, reduced to power by one, but then multiplied by the derivative of the inner function, the derivative of secant is secant times tangent. All right, so we can put that together, a couple of secants, as it turns out, it's gonna give us the secant squared again, but maybe 
enough for the reason you would have expected. So two secant squared x tangent x is my second derivative. I'm going to take that and set it equal to zero. All right. Now, just like we did before, I know it's a lot, but one of the first things I did after we found our first derivative was I converted it over into sines and cosines. So that's what I'm going to do here. So this is the same as saying negative two times one over cosine squared X times sine X over cosine X. When you put it all together through multiplication, you get zero is equal to negative two sine X over cosine cubed X. Now remember when we're looking for points of inflection, we don't set it equal to undefined. So it's really just a matter of putting this zero over one and cross multiply. All right, when you cross multiply, you get zero is equal to negative two sine X. Divide by negative two, you get zero is equal to sine X. Then we would just look in our unit circle, specifically in the domain that's referenced, for any instance in which the sine function is equal to zero, that only happens when you're on the x-axis. The x-axis have y values of zero and sine is the y coordinate in any point around the unit circle. So long story short, x would have to be equal to zero. And you know what, just looking at the graph, that does look like where the point of inflection would be. It appears to be concave up over here it appears to be concave down over here. At the origin, it looks like that's where we have our change over. So then we just got to make a sign chart out of this. Okay. So the sign chart, again, start off with our X values consistent with the domain, negative pi over two. We got we have three important values, all right? My possible point of inflection along with my critical values, all right? My endpoint on my domain is parentheses, negative pi over two. The next value along the domain would be negative pi over four. So we'd stop at negative pi over four. And we go from negative pi over four to zero. We'd stop at zero and go from zero to pi over four, stop at pi over four, and then we'd go to the go the rest of the way in our domain, which would get us from pi over four to pi over two. All right, we need to evaluate our first derivative or second derivative and draw a conclusion with the world's tiniest sign chart. Eh, who am I kidding? I've made smaller. The writer's cramp there. All right. But like I was saying in the last problem, there's no reason why you should have to do this part of it by hand. H prime, now that we know the second derivative is going to work, H prime of A, add the slider for A, H double prime. So shift up. The only thing is we're looking at values that are incremental, but in terms of trigonometric quantities, like uh, in this case, radians. And right? so having a slider that goes from negative 10 to 10 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Instead, I'd adjust my low bound to go 
from or my my two bounds to go from negative pi over two to pi over two. They have the the less than or equal to symbols built in. There's nothing I could do about that. But we would just ignore the two endpoints here, the negative pi over two and pi over two. And then I'd have it go in a step that's smaller than than the interval itself, a lot smaller. But I tend to think in terms of unit circle values when it comes to radians. And so when you're working your way around the unit circle, you know, we think of things like pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, stuff like that. So though, any of those would be fine. Um, I tend to just take the common denominator for all of those, six, four, and three. The least common denominator would be 12. So I tend to default to a, a step value of pi over 12. All right. And then you can see all these values that come up. You just kind of kind of sort of have to keep track. Now, if if the decimals are too much in terms of you know overwhelmingness, you know, you could try changing it to something else like pi over six and see if it if it looks more recognizable, but odds are it's it's not gonna look too comfortable. All right. Worst case scenario, what you can do is manually type in your numbers. So if you're not comfortable with this, uh, this manipulating the endpoints approach, what you can do instead, so I just wipe that out real quick. I'll add a slider here, back to A. Just manually type in a value in each interval. Like for example, negative pi over two to negative pi over four. Right smack in the middle would be negative pi over three. All right, so you could go that route. Just just split the difference between the denominators. All right, so negative pi over three. We see a negative value for the first derivative, a positive value for the second derivative. It's decreasing concave up. That being said, this slider approach is wonderful. However, if you can already pick out where the turning points are on the graph, you already know that it's gonna be decreasing going into a minimum. And if you know that minimum is at negative pi over four, just based off looking at the picture, then you would know that the derivative going into that X value corresponding with the minimum, that critical value, that would have to be negative, the, the derivative sign, right? Any of these values would have to have a derivative that's negative. Any of these values would have to have a derivative that's positive because it's coming out of a minimum going into a maximum. So everything between negative pi over four and positive pi over four would have to have a positive first derivative, right? So, you know, like halfway between negative pi over four and zero, you can go like, negative pi over five, negative pi over six, just make the denominator bigger. So just type that in if you want, or you can use the sliders, There's a lot of different approaches, but I'll, I'll just go to negative pi over eight. See, positive value for the first derivative, positive value for the, oops, for the second derivative, it's increasing and concave up, right? That's consistent with what I have in the diagram here. It's increasing over this interval. So in this little interval here, it's definitely going uphill and it's still in the part of the graph that's concave up. This part of the graph right up until what we think the inflection point is, is all facing upwards, all right? So then once we get to the inflection point, now we're looking at values between zero and pi over four. So instead of a negative pi over eight, it'd go positive pi over eight, for example. Now I'm looking at values that are positive for the first derivative and negative for the second derivative. So that's increasing concave down. That's consistent with what I see here. It's bowing downward, all right? But it's also still going uphill, all right? So we have no change in concavity around negative pi over four, but it is going from decreasing to increasing, which means we have a relative min, all right? We do have a change in concavity around zero. So that's a point of inflection. 
right? So then the only other thing to verify would be what's happening after pi over four, between pi over four and pi over two. So maybe you put in pi over three, positive this time. And you see our values are negative, negative. All right, negative, negative, decreasing, concave down, All right? So no change in concavity, but it is changing in slope, going from increasing to decreasing. So this is the relative max. And that's a lot of writing, but you know the, the, the number crunching part of it should be somewhat more manageable, I would say, right? Now, you could also try if you want to try to get the solutions using Desmos, in a lot of ways it involves some estimation, but if you put in H prime of X, it'll at least give you the graph of the derivative function. All right, so if I look at the graph of the derivative function and see where it crosses the X axis, that would give me an indication of critical value. All right, because again, what do we do when we find our first derivative? We set it equal to zero. What does it mean to set something equal to zero and solve? You're finding x-intercepts, All right? So if I graph my first derivative and find the x-intercepts, I can hop all the way to the critical values all in one shot, All right? I can get to these just based off of the graph. That being said, we could have got those based off of you know, the original function. All right, second derivative, you know, so it's just really another way to look at it. See if this works. There's my second derivative. Again, looking for the x-intercept, that happens at zero, so we can get to this value here. Just working off the original function, and it's, you know, sort of a hybrid approach. It's not, it's not analytic, but it's not purely graphical in the sense that you are solving an equation in some capacity, but uh, it's kind of a, a halfway point between the two. All right. So there's definitely a lot of stuff going on with this one. And you know, like you, you tend to see that kind of thing happen with trig functions because periodic functions have to have a domain restriction. Otherwise you'd have infinitely many solutions. You know, if I say given a function without any kind of domain restriction. So here, this original function, and then I, I don't restrict the domain. Some of you found this out on the tech assignment, where it's like the, uh, the examples that you were given had domain restrictions and some other, some other folks didn't have that. It's because periodic functions go on forever. And so I'd look at this and I'd say, okay, well, if somebody said, find the relative max and relative min, I'd look at it and say, okay, all of them? You want every one of them? That's a lot. You know, I'd have to focus on each one of these things. You know, but the good thing about looking at it in a uh, in a more holistic sense is that if you find a trend in your do I'm trying to get a good good dumb, uh, good window here. If you find a trend, then you can draw a conclusion about where the relative extrema are in, you know, propagating throughout the entire function. You know, so you, you learn everything there is to know about one piece. And if you know it repeats periodically, you can start drawing more and more conclusions about, you know, the broader function, All right? So for these questions saying, find all the relative extrema, but this is following the second derivative test, uh, second derivative test for relative extrema, so the way we would handle this is by, by finding, we wouldn't even create a sign chart here. We would find the first derivative, 3x squared minus 18x plus 27. We find the second derivative, 6x minus 18, all right? Now what we do is we take our critical values and we plug it into our second derivative. All right, so what we need are critical values and we get those by 
setting our first derivative equal to zero or one over zero. So zero would be equal to this whole shibbity bangity boom, but it's quadratic, so that's not a, that big of a deal. Yeah, and I say this fairly frequently, not uh, not broken record level, but you know, pretty close. It's not an algebra course. When it comes to solving a simple equation, solve it any way you can. I just need x equals, right? So if that means Desmos or TI calculator, I leave that up to you. But it doesn't really matter how you get it. I mean, if you want to factor and solve, by all means, go for it. But here I see that I have an x-intercept at zero, so x is going to, I'm sorry, at three, so x would be equal to three, all right? So what we would do is evaluate our second derivative at that location, all right? And see what we get. So in this case, you know, right off the bat, we find the one instance where the whole process fails but we did do the work that we would need to do in order to determine the extreme values using a, a sign chart, All right? So if I replace the X with a three, I get a result of zero. That's the one condition where the second derivative test for extrema fails, All right? So that would tell us that we'd have to go back and identify any extrema if they exist using a sign chart, right? But all the all the, the bells and whistles, the bits and pieces are here and ready to go, right? Because I know the critical value, there's only one of them, and I actually know a possible point of inflection, all right? Because if I take my second derivative and set it equal to zero and solve, that's a possible point of inflection. The, the reverse is also true. If I take a number and plug it into my second derivative and get a result of zero, that means that that number that was substituted in is a possible point of inflection. Because that's what you would have gotten if you took our second derivative and set it equal to zero anyway. So all it, the, the good thing about the second derivative test for, uh, for extrema is that even if it fails, it puts you on a path to very quickly getting the right answer or the, the complete solution. So X negative infinity to three, three and then three to infinity, right? It's a um, polynomial function. So there isn't really too much to do here in terms of uh, domain restrictions and stuff like that. So I need to evaluate my first derivative, my second derivative. Well, actually, no, we're just looking for extrema. So just the first derivative, All right? Conclusion. So my first derivative again is this function. All right, which we are actually already have graphed. I can make that call that f of x. I know it's not the original f of x, but I want to have it as a function. I'll call it g of x, actually, just to avoid some kind of confusion here. Uh, confusion being the word of the day. Okay, so I'm going to use confusion as the word of the day. All right, so any value less than 3, I'll use the a. Any value less than 3, followed by any value greater than three, All right? In each case, we're looking at positive values, All right? So positive for any value less than three. So see, even as I approach the three and it becomes a zero, all the values less than three are still positive. All the values, greater than three are also positive. So positive to positive, increasing to increasing. What this is telling us is that there's no relative extrema. 
That's why the second derivative test failed. It actually, it's, it's kind of weird. It's more of a philosophical question. It's like, did it really fail? There were no relative extrema. So I would say that if the test failed if there were relative extrema and it didn't tell us that. But it, was in, it, it didn't give us a conclusion because there was no relative extrema to begin with. I, I don't even know. So that that's like the kind of question where it's like what what's what's the purpose? Um so anyway, four. So The next one, f of x is equal to x over x minus one. We know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals one. So that means that the domain exists everywhere except for the x value of one. All right. So I'm going to take the derivative of this. So we're going to take the derivative, we're going to take the second derivative. All right, the first derivative, I'm going to use quotient rule. Low d high. Low d high. Minus high d low over denominator squared and in in the way we go. So we need to simplify because we have to set this equal to zero and we have to set it equal to one over zero. All right, so x minus one minus x over x minus one squared. So very nicely, the x's in the numerator cancel away and we're left with negative one over x minus one squared, All right? That, in order to find critical values, we're gonna set equal to zero. So zero equals one over zero equals. We're gonna set it equal to zero. We're gonna set it equal to undefined or one over zero. So in the case, of setting it equal to zero, when you cross multiply, you get a cancellation. You get zero equals negative one. That's a contradiction, so disregard that one. The other one you cross multiply, you get x minus one squared is equal to zero. So x minus one would be equal to zero. And then when you solve that, you get x equals one. Now you might think that that's a critical value because you know you, you solve the equation and you got this result. However, I already stated it, but I'm gonna create the graph here. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals one. which means there's no graph there. So it can't be a critical value because there's no, there's no curve there. F of X doesn't exist there, all right? This is the location of the vertical asymptote. So this one for a very different reason has no relative extrema. Just so I can keep this one up on the screen, I'm gonna do number seven, then I'll circle back and get number six, all right? So these are two 
continuous differentiable trig functions. They exist for all values of X. There's no asymptotes. So I'm not worried about that. No restrictions on the domain. So I jump right into the derivative F prime of X is equal to cosine of X minus sine of X. All right, cosine of X minus sine of X. I'm gonna take that, set it equal to zero. There's no instance in which this function, this derivative function would ever be undefined. So there's really no point in setting it equal to one over zero, but you can, if you want. I'm not going to just to kind of cut down on a lot of the fluff here. When I go to solve this equation, I would add sine to both sides and I get sine X is equal to cosine of X, which is kind of a weird equation, but it's more of a, more of a thinking equation than anything else. Because I'd be looking for any instance in which the sine value and the cosine values are equivalent to one another. So on the unit circle, the X value is cosine, the Y value is sine for any coordinate. So I'm just looking for any instance in which those values are the same. Right? It happens when you're on the unit circle and the coordinates are radical two over two comma radical two over two. That happens at pi over four. And also when the coordinates are negative radical two over two comma negative radical two over two, that happens at five pi over four. But there's no restriction on this domain. So these critical values, we've got to be careful about them. We're only going to be able to draw a conclusion about one full period of this particular function, but this is a periodic function that exists infinitely. So I'm going to have to account for that in my final answer. Might want to look at the picture, sine of X plus cosine of X. All right, let me get rid of this. I don't need the asymptote anymore. So this is what sine of X plus cosine of X looks like. If you just focus on one full period, and it's kind of hard to see what one full period would be, but if you're kind of living in this interval here, it looks like I got a full sine wave, or at least something that looks like a sine wave. What I could do is I could restrict the domain here to go from zero to two pi. And that'll give me most of the, well, it'll give me all the important parts of the trig function. And then we can see what's happening at the extremes, which appear to be pi over four and, and five pi over four. That's weird. I hear my phone ringing, but it's not my phone that's ringing. Whatever. I think my wife might have left her other phone. Anyway, so that's consistent with the critical values. It looks like I might have a point of inflection at three pi over four. So F double prime of X, derivative of cosine is negative sine of X, derivative of negative sine of X is negative cosine of X. Oh, sorry. Yes, there might be a point of inflection at negative at three pi over four, but that's not what the question is asking. We do need our second derivative, but only for the purpose of determining analytically whether each of these are relative extrema, and if so, what kind of extreme values they are. All right. So what I can do, just to save myself time and energy, now that we know that we can do this, f prime. F double prime, I should say, of pi over four. So F double prime of pi over four, that's a negative number. Doesn't matter what the number is, just matters what the sign is. So that's less than zero, all right? F double prime of five pi over four, that's a positive number.
the second derivative test for extrema tells us that if the sign at the critical value for the second derivative is negative, then there's a relative max when x is equal to pi over four. If the sign is positive, so it's the opposite of what you would expect necessarily, but there's a reason for that, all right? So if the sign is positive for the critical value in the second derivative, then that's a relative minimum, specifically when x is equal to the five pi over four. All right, so the reason why this, this works out the way it does is because if the second derivative is positive, it means that it's concave up. If there's an extreme value on an interval of a graph that's concave up, like for example, this graph, that extreme value must be a minimum. If there is a extreme value on an interval that's concave down, that extreme value must be a maximum. All right. That's the justification there, but we've kind of run into a, a bigger problem here. And that is, well, this, this isn't the only part of the graph that's relevant. We have to go from negative infinity to infinity. So I need an answer that's going to embody that. So I'm going to get rid of this domain restriction. And when we do that, we see that this, this certainly is an infinite graph. I know I have a maximum of pi over four, a minimum at five pi over four. The next maximum is at nine pi over four, right? That's what you would get if you took pi over four and added to it two pi, right? Negative uh, seven pi over four is what you would get if you took pi over four and subtracted from it two pi. So my relative maximum values, and, and that, that trend is periodic, so it continues, right? So the relative max values are gonna happen when X is equal to pi over four, plus not just two pi, but any multiple of two pi, where that multiple involves a whole number or, oh, actually really an integer, but positive or negative whole number, so I'll say, 2 pi k, where k belongs to the set of integers, all right? So that funky z is a symbol for integers. It's, it's like, a, like a 7 and an l that are kind of merged together. They actually really should be just a smidge closer. But I can never make it look the way it's supposed to. It's kind of like a z with an extra, so z with an extra little little business in the middle, but this is how I make it. We'll try it again. There we go, a little bit better. Gotta, gotta do it nice and slow and careful way. All right, so that's the relative max, the relative min. X is equal to five pi over four, also plus two pi K. Because if I take this minimum five pi over four, and I look at the next minimum, the next instance of a minimum, that's two pi beyond five pi over four, right? Because you're really adding eight pi over four, which is the same as two pi, right? And it's the same in the other direction except subtraction, right? So where k belongs to the set of integers, and that gets you every possible extreme value for the graph. Right. I'll put a star on the on the the one that we skipped over here. Like I said uh, last time, the the curve sketching page it's really kind of irrelevant because it's all kind of the same stuff except. We don't really need to worry about graphing the function because we, we let the technology do that, do that for us. So what I wanted to do now is shift gears and talk about some word problems, all right? So 
let me stop this recording.